Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm just going to talk about my untold Muhammad Ali story today. Um, our family has a long uh, family connection uh, to the Ali family, um, which date back, dates back prior to my birth. So I'm just going to share some of our uh, family history here. As I stood at the funeral of this man I knew as a beloved uncle, I was overcome by the deep sadness, but yet my heart was swelling with pride. To the world, Ali was an icon, the world champion, an activist, a change maker, and the greatest athlete of our time. But to me, he was so much more. My family's connection to Ali began prior to my prior to my birth, and part of my story is unearthed from family photos and the many stories that have been passed down to me over the years. Um, and the other part of my story is from my own personal memories of being around Muhammad Ali. Before the champ was Muhammad Ali, my father, my aunt, my grandmother, and my two uncles shared space, time, love, and a passion for boxing and sports with the young Cassius Clay on the streets of Chicago and in the ring. My paternal uncle Farouk was a boxer and he trained at the same gym with the young Cassius Clay. My father and my other uncle were, uh, my father and my other uncle were sports lovers and boxing enthusiasts and they spent much of the time at the gym supporting their brother, who was my, un who was my uncle. My uncle was the Michigan State champ, bo boxing champ, before he later went on to win the National Golden Glove Championship. Yes, we had our own boxing champ in the family. It was at the gym where my father and his two brothers became like brothers with the young, spunky Cassius Clay. And there's a video that I'd like to show, if we could um, show the video. It's a quick video. So that's in, sh that's in this city of Chicago. That's my uncle and Muhammad Ali on the streets of Chicago. It's duking it out. He later on uh, went on staff. He, be he became part of his training camp. Now that's my father right there in the green shirt. And this was prior to my birth. Now I spent my whole life wondering how my father knocked down the greatest boxing champ in the world, but that's a story for another day. So when Cassius Clay later converted to Islam through the nation, the newly named Muhammad Ali didn't wait a moment to express his disappointment with his Lebanese Muslim friends. Ali put his arm around my uncle in a chokehold and in his typical Ali manner said, and I quote, I ought to whoop your behind for not telling me about Islam sooner. The sad reality is that my father and my uncles they were brought up as orphans, and they didn't know that much about Islam. After Ali's acceptance of Islam, he never allowed anyone to call him by his name, by the name of Cassius Clay. To the world, he was now the great Muhammad Ali. However, for those of us who were in his inner circles, we all called him Muhammad Ali Clay. When Muhammad Ali Clay was stripped of his heavyweight championship and his license to box, because he refused to be drafted to the Vietnam War, it was my uncles and my father who stood by his side and supported him during these tumultuous times. To the world, Ali appeared fearless, adamant, bold, brave, and outspoken. However, for the people who had close encounters, they could clearly see through the facade to notice his inner pain. But despite his, hid his hidden agony, Ali always stood up for what he believed in, and he never backed down nor compromised his principles. His courage was a beacon of light to the millions of Americans who opposed the war in Vietnam when he said, and I quote, 
You want to send me to jail? Fine, go right ahead. I've been in jail for 400 years. I could be there for four or five more, but I ain't going no 10,000 miles away to help murder and kill other poor pe people. If I want to die, I'll die right here, right now, fighting you. If I want to die, you my enemy, not no Chinese, no Viet Cong, no Japanese. You my opposer when I want freedom. You my opposer when I want justice. You my opposer when I want equality. You want me to go somewhere and fight for you, you won't even stand up for me right here at home, right here in America, for my rights and for my religious beliefs. You won't even stand, for my, stand up for me for my rights right here at home. For that, Ali risked his career, risked his fame, risked his livelihood, and risked everything that he had for his beliefs and for his principles. Ali did not only oppose the Vietnam War, but he also was an advocate for Palestinian civil rights and fervently opposed the Israeli occupation. Muhammad Ali, more than anyone else, understood that his freedom and the freedom of his people would be incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people. Ali called for justice wherever he saw injustice. Ali was proud to be black and he was proud to be Muslim unapologetically. And this was at a time when it was neither cool to be black and it was neither cool to be Muslim. He gave blacks a sense of dignity and he gave Muslims a sense of pride. And alhamdulillah, it gives me great pleasure to know that the men in my life, my father and my uncles, stood by him and supported him tooth and nail despite the odds that were against him. Muhammad Ali Clay didn't wait for others to define his existence. He boldly told the, told the world who he was, and I quote, I don't have to be what you want me to be. I am free to be what I want to be. You see, Ali, in his mind, untangled and uprooted the various narratives of oppression by refusing to accept an ethos of conformity. Ali represented a free black man in a segregated Jim Crow era of America. And let's not forget, he never let anyone forget that he was a proud Muslim too. This is a lesson for us Muslims to stand up and reject any notion of Islamophobia and that we should never let anyone let, let us Muslims feel inferior to any other American. When Muhammad Ali Clay was permitted to fight again, my uncle Salemi, who you saw in the video, um, whom Ali called Hassan, had become an integral part of the Muhammad Ali training camp. And it was my uncle who was hired to be his official assistant trainer. My uncle would travel all over the world with Muhammad Ali Clay to prepare him for his next fights. Upon their return, my uncle would bring back custom-made t-shirts engraved with our names for all of us, for my cousins, my siblings, and Muhammad Ali's children. We called them the Muhammad Ali family t-shirts. To the world, Muhammad Ali was the greatest athlete of all time. But he was so much more than just a boxing legend. He was the people's champ, for sure. But to me, my siblings, to my cousins, Muhammad Ali Clay was family, who sometimes showed up for dinner unexpectedly. He was like that favorite uncle who always knew how to make us laugh. And he spent time playing with us. When we would go to his house, they wouldn't shuffle us off to another room and say, hey, we adults have to sit down and talk. No, he would actually sit and spend time with the kids. He would show us his magic tricks and, and he would pull out the toys and, um, and he would tell us about his neighbors. Um, this is when he had, he had lived in different cities. He was in Michigan for a while, in Chicago. But this is when we, we were all in California. He lived in LA. We used to visit him uh, at his house in LA. And his neighbors were Michael Jackson and uh, Diana Ross. And he used to ask us if we wanted to, you know, go visit, you know, if he, want, if he would want to introduce us to, you know, this, his celebrity neighbors. And we'd get all excited and everything. And, you know, the reality is when, when we were younger, when we were kids, we really didn't know much about Muhammad Ali and who he was. I mean, to us, he was just, he was, 
he was uncle, you know, and we cared more about playing and playing, you know, what new toys came. We weren't concerned or uh, we weren't excited that he was the greatest athlete. You know, we, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize who this man was. It wasn't until I got older um, that I, that I, I guess I took all those years for granted, not really, um, you know, but I, I, you know, and I, I guess that's what part of being a kid is. You really don't understand the caliber of people and, and you don't really value people for who they are. Uh, but when you get older, you, you really appreciate the adults that were in your life and what they did for you. Um, I have so many memories of Muhammad Ali. Um, it's hard to, to say which ones were my favorites, but I, I remember uh, vividly one incident. We were at the, one of the masjids in Orange County, and we had brought Muhammad Ali to, to the masjid uh, to meet and greet the community. And of course, as soon as the car pulled up and, and he, uh, the door opened, a, a, a swarm of men came around the car and hurtled around him. And, uh, and so he was standing in the middle, you know, and all these men were all around him. And my cousin and I were, you know, we were teenagers at the time, and we were standing off to the side. Uh, and as soon as he spotted us, he came walking over to my cousin and I, and we were just like, oh my gosh, there's like 40 men around him, and then it's this wave of men walking towards us, and we're like, oh my goodness. And he didn't care what the men thought. He wasn't like, oh my ego, I have. He came over and he hugged us, and because, you know, he, he loved children. He really, that was one of his, I would say, one of his weak um, weaknesses is that he loved children so much. And, and, um, and it really made my cousin and I feel special. But he had that gift. He had that gift to make every person who was in his company feel special and feel important. Um, also, another one of, uh, one of Muhammad Ali's greatest gifts, in my opinion, was his ability to connect with people deeply. He didn't care if you were black or white, if you were Jewish or atheist, if you were Sunni or Shia, if you were gay or straight. But what he did care most about is whether you were poor or oppressed, whether you were hungry or sick, whether you were elderly or orphaned, or whether you had any needs in general. Um, that was his concern, and he saw the humanity in each of us, and he made sure to make other people suffering his business. In his fame and fortune, Muhammad Ali never forgot that he was born Cassius Clay, made from clay, and that he was a poor kid from Louisville, Kentucky. Ali may have been a Kentuckian, but according to his wife Lonnie, he belonged to the world. He had a big heart and he spent his life in service to others and fighting racial and economic oppression of his people. Looking back at his legacy, I realized that he was so unique, but yet he was like so many of us today. He was a man who worked hard, and he worked hard to make his dreams come true. And he stood up by any means necessary for what he believed in. In my own personal journey and my pursuit for freedom, equality, and justice for all people, I have taken a, si a similar path of becoming an advocate for truth and for justice and for righteousness. Now in my adult life, I value him even more. For, s for him to be born black, poor, and then convert to Islam and end up being the champion of champions, Despite the objections and the hatred that he faced, my love and respect for him just continues to grow and grow. At Muhammad Ali's funeral, I saw hundreds of thousands of people coming together to celebrate the life of a celebrity, a great man, a champion. There was an aura of excitement in the air, and many people were taking advantage of a publicity op opportunity to be at the funeral of the people's champ. For me, however, Muhammad Ali Clay's death symbolized something very different. It marked the death of a generation of people that ceased to exist. 
Muhammad Ali Clay had a strong, unwa unwavering moral compass. So did my father, so did my uncles, so did my aunt, and so did the many men and women who were in his inner circles. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to know Muhammad Ali Clay and the people that were around him, you'll know, you'll know what I'm talking about. I don't see too many men and women around, uh, like them around anymore. Muhammad Ali Clay's le legacy will live on. It will live on through me, through my cousins, through my siblings. It will live on through his children, through his wife, through his family members, and it will also live on through the many of our brethren in humanity who choose to follow his path and to continue on his legacy. If there ever was a modern man who could be known as the leader of the human race, that would be Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali Clay told the world about Islam and Muslims by any means necessary. And now it is my hope that you continue Ali's lifelong mission and legacy by any means necessary. Before I close, uh, I'm gonna close with a few uh, quotes of his. I'd like to just ask all of you to make dua uh, for the deceased um, Muhammad Ali. Uh, also for my father and for my uncles and the many uh, righteous uh, people who passed before. I'm very proud uh, and honored to have known the great Muhammad Ali. And he has really, um, for so many, have been an example of what it means to be a great human being. His greatness and he spent the, the, the last 30 years of his life fighting Parkinson's disease and purifying himself of any sins or any, any wrongdoings that, that, that he's done. And I think it's important here to note that there's a context to everything. And so when we refer to Muhammad Ali as being the greatest, um, or when he referred to himself as being the greatest, there's a context there. Of course, Allah is the greatest, and there is nothing or nobody that is greater than Allah. So in that spirit, I would just like to say that what I believe made him truly the greatest was his conviction for our deen, deen al-Islam, and that his ability to be able to take those principles and the values that we have in our deen and to implement it into his life and to be a walking peacemaker, a compassionate one, the one who loved everyone, loved all of humanity. So with that, um, I would like to just close with a few of his quotes. The first one is, live every day as if it were your last, because someday you're going to be right. This one really elevates consciousness. And the second one is, I wish people would love everybody else the way they love me. It would make for a better world. Thank you.